Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Fret Buzz the Podcast. My name is Aaron Sefcik, and today we're going to jump into part two with Brent Lyons of the Solving Sounds podcast. Today we're going to get into Brent's process of how he writes and records an album. We also get into the idea of recording a couple songs for like an EP versus something like an album. Then we talk about the advantages of using different instruments to kind of fill the sonic space of the album and the positives that that has. And later on in the episode, we start talking about how the general public consumes music and how that's changed over the years and maybe where it's going in the future. For those of you who may not know, we also have a YouTube channel, so all of these episodes are available on the Fret Buzz The Podcast YouTube channel. So stop by, subscribe, and check us out. Again, I also want to plug that on May 3rd, we will be doing our one-month song feedback club live on YouTube. And that's where every month you start a new idea, nothing old, but everything new. Um, And you write a song from start to finish. Submit that to fretbuzzthepodcast.com. And our panel on May 3rd will give you feedback and critique your song. If this sounds interesting to you, by all means, stop by Fret Buzz the podcast. Go down to the submit button there in the middle of the page. Send us a link to your SoundCloud or wherever you may have your music. Uh, You can always send an an MP3 or anything like that. It's a fairly simple process. So looking forward to hearing all of your submissions, and hopefully we'll see you on May 3rd. With that, let's get back to the episode with Brent Lyons of Solving Sounds Podcast on Fret Buzz, the podcast. So, okay, uh, let's uh, jump into this whole idea of writing yeah. uh, an, an album from start to, to finish um, and that process and what it entails and all the trials and tribulations that one might go through. Yeah. Um, have you actually gone through the process of, of actually releasing an album that you've created your own, Brent? Yeah, that's right. Uh, I have it. um on Spotify and iTunes. It's actually called Inflow is what I called it just because it was kind of this like difficult thing for me to do, especially when it came to the vocals. I hadn't really done that before. Mm-hmm. So I was kind of like freaked out about it. So I thought of it as like, uh, I named it Inflow because it was sort of like me trying to get past that phase and get to a spot where things were just kind of like flowing and, and um, coming through without any sort of like judgment or fear and just trying to kind of be creative for its own sake without sort of being super analytical about it but at the same time it's like when you're doing a big project like that by yourself you know the process is so slow you kind of can't help but be analytical so i found a large component of it to be about making decisions and being able to kind of stick with it especially like in the demoing process when you're first kind of figuring out what the songs are Um, we kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier, but when you're working in logic or pro tools, you can just, you can really go into a black hole if there's no one to kind of bring you back out, you know, when it comes to just adding things or trying to make things work. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Uh, On a macro level, did you approach this album as a larger concept that all fit together and then write the songs to, to, fit the album's needs or did you write songs and then conglomerate them into an album yeah um it's kind of interesting the way it worked out i wrote the songs in batches which i really like doing and would recommend i would write um four songs at a time Mm -hmm. and at first um i would do all the instrumentation and then go back and do all the vocals later and um it's it's funny because uh, I found breaking it up that way into chunks helped keep the spark of it alive because um, if you do like 10 or, or 11 or 12 songs or whatever, yeah. and you write them all before going into the studio, at least in my experience, I found a lot of times the older ones, you're kind of over a little bit or it's like you i don't know there's like a a ticking clock with like the freshness of a song to me and i feel like you need to capture that while you're still sort of excited about it because um for me i've definitely found the newest thing i write is my favorite you know i get the most excited about it and i think if i 
wait too long to record older songs. It kind of loses its magic. So I think it's really cool to kind of capture it while you still have that. Um, the hardest part, and you can't you can't really avoid this, is when you do kind of release the whole thing when it's all done. Even still, those those first four songs, I'm sort of like, oh, those aren't as good. I'm kind of over them a little bit compared to like the later songs. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but in terms of like a concept, I did uh, sort of take on um, like a lyrical concept, and it it was just sort of about um, like I was saying earlier, trying to get out of my own way just because I was um, kind of nervous or maybe just didn't have the self-confidence to try to pull something like that off. Cause it is, you have to be careful, right? Cause you can, it can be this like ego thing of like, Oh, look at how great I am. I'm showing off. I can like do all this stuff, which I was really trying to avoid. <laughs> um, and also you can run into this thing where um, people are impressed that you did that, but it's like, that can bleed over into what they think of the songs. Like, is it a good song? Does it stand alone as a song itself? Or is it good because you overdubbed everything yourself? Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So you kind of have to check that um, part of yourself. But um, yeah, that was kind of the loose concept. And uh, yeah, it was interesting too, um, because as I was doing the chunks, after I did the first four, I found myself writing in response to those first four and i actually like that because i was always thinking in an album context mm -hmm. and um i'd write the, the first four were just whatever came out and then the the next batch i was like well i don't think i have like the opener to an album yet like i'm super into like sequencing and kind of like the journey of an album yeah. like i don't like songs that are just like a bunch of uh, one-off songs thrown together in a collection you run into that a lot with like eps i found just because you don't really have the time and space to kind of carve out uh like dynamics or a sequence or arrangement that takes you somewhere but with an album you can really kind of immerse yourself into this world that you're creating mm -hmm. so i found that um i got really into okay i need to write like the opening track how do i want the album to start mm -hmm. and um just for my particular taste, I really like albums that have an introduction. And um, I created this first song that was half the songs, just like the intro. It's kind of like a slow fade in thing. You know, it's kind of it's kind of shoegaze. It just kind of like sets the tone and you just kind of groove. And then it like kicks into um, like a traditional rock song. But I thought it would be kind of cool to have the intro be like half the song. So then I wrote this kind of like compartmentalized rock song where it was like, uh, like the intro was the chorus riff and then I do like a rock and verse and then a, the rock and chorus, but now it's vocals. And then I would do like a quiet verse and then kind of a bridge that was like an inverted version of the chorus, but all that would be like two minutes and then the song's over. So it's like a four minute song, but like half of it's just this kind of build up intro. Right, right. And I think if I had just sat down and wrote a song, I never would have got there because I wouldn't be thinking in that kind of context of an album. Mm. Um, so I, I think that is super helpful when you are writing an album to think, okay, how do I want it to start? How do I want it to end? Okay, I have all these rockers. I need something to go against all that. You know, right. just thinking in terms of dynamics and arrangements. That that's always my favorite part of an album, or just writing in general, even within a song. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's kind of how I loosely approached the the sort of concept of it. I wish I could do more of that. I I get caught up like there's not time to record an album for me like just with my schedule like I get I feel the need like I need a certain type of song for promotional reasons in order to you know get a gig or whatever and so I end up like writing something to fit the need of that like the promotion that I need rather mm -hmm. than being like I want to write a masterpiece that people will want to listen to it's more like I need a venue owner who has who's going to give me 10 seconds. I need them to listen and like what they hear in the first 10 seconds. It's yeah. like the exact opposite of what you're talking about. And I like I completely appreciate what you're saying. I wish I could do that. Just so busy. Yeah. And it, it is all about intention. Like for me, this was just like a passion project, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I, so I totally hear what you're saying as well. Um, 
but for me you know i just really like the idea of kind of having like a definitive statement that was kind of mine that's like out there forever yeah and mm -hmm. just the idea of like okay if it was just you know it's got my name on it what what do i want to say in in that time frame you know and and i kind of have an old school mentality when it comes to albums and songs in general like i i love a full length lp i love diving into a world that an artist creates and sitting in it for a while but i'm very conscious of the fact that that is not how most people feel <laughs> not anymore music in 2019 yeah so i i definitely think your perspective is definitely more kind of current in that it's like how do you grab people right away and kind of hold them you know get people's attention that's kind of the the premium today yeah. in terms yeah. of uh music listeners i would say yes yeah. it's kind of a sad necessity yeah yeah i miss the days of the album that's for sure yeah and i mean the cool thing about doing music for fun or not trying to make a living off of it is i approach it as i'm going to do exactly what i want mm -hmm. all the time and if you know like it that's fine i'll listen to it but it's like just for me i want my you know statement or whatever to be exactly what i want and kind of impartial to what's like popular at the time yeah yeah, it's kind of interesting talking about all this. I'm kind of in the back of my mind here at Fret Buzz, uh, the podcast every month uh, at the end of the month where we hold a, a challenge. It's not a competition, but it's more of like a, a challenge for one's self in terms of going through the process of writing something in one month, start to finish. You actually don't work with any old ideas. It's all new ideas. So on the first of the month, you just start from scratch and start creating one song and by the end of the month uh you share that 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 song with the community uh and then you get actual feedback in terms of what people thought was good what maybe you should work on um so it's a good because obviously when we write songs um and we share it with our friends or family or fans even uh, they're a little biased you know they're gonna love sure. no matter what you produce they're gonna love it um so it's kind of interesting to hear an outsider's perspective, especially if maybe you're writing in a genre that um, one of us or um, any one of the members of the community that are not exactly familiar with that genre, whether you know whether it's uh, EDM or hip hop or jazz or rock or whatever it is, um, even classical. We've had people uh, submit like classical pieces. Um, and so maybe you may not be that well versed in it, but it's always interesting to hear one's feedback on something like that to kind of get this outsider's perspective and to give you going into the next month, maybe a couple things to think about. And then hopefully by the end of this journey, if it ever ends, um, that you just become a better songwriter because you've been pointed out some things that maybe you could or would want to work on. Yeah, I think that's great. I think it's it's really special when you can have people that will like give it to you straight. Cause I've definitely run into that where it's like friends and family will listen to your stuff and you'll be like, oh, what'd you think? And they'll be like, it's great. It's like, oh, what parts? All of it, you know? Right. Um, right. So I definitely <laughs> have uh, anything. <laughs> yeah. So I, I definitely have uh, a few musician friends where we've kind of established this like trust with each other mm. where um we're sort of brutally honest with each other and it comes from like a loving place yeah. because it's like we know you're not going to hear this from anyone everyone's going to give you the it's all great speech or whatever yeah so i really value um those few people that i do have that will tell me exactly what they think and and i do that with them you know i'll think of like the worst possible thing I can say. I mean, it's like, <laughs> it's like, okay, here's like the most nitty gritty thing. I feel that it's like, I don't, I love 90% of it. This 10 thing, 10% 10 thing is like, eh, I can do without it. But it's like, I'm going to tell you about it because I know no one else will. Right. And you don't even have to take it. It's just like, I know that we have this relationship where we can trust each other and be brutally honest with, with each other and it's all good. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think having that, that level of feedback and, positive criticism is is essential yes and it can be so hard for a new songwriter who's who's not confident in their songwriting to take that criticism yeah but not, not personally yeah <laughs> you know you're like just trying to write a song at all and you know yeah but it, it is if, very helpful yeah especially if there's something that you're insecure about and then 
you get that feedback that and you're just like, oh my God, I knew it. They just confirmed it. Yeah, yeah. The worst. You know, just yeah, yeah. confirming your insecurities. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> it's like, I know, I know, I know. Yep. I <laughs> I'm know. working on it. I'm working yeah. on it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. So when you uh, recorded your album, are you uh, doing everything um, acoustically? Or are you actually recording real drums? Are you recording real guitars, real bass? Or are you doing it anything in the box? Or how does that process happen? Yeah, I'm uh, kind of old school in that I do everything real. Like, I remember when I was a teenager, I was super hardcore about things being real. Like, I remember I wouldn't even listen to music, like, because I'm like a rock and roll kid, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And I remember, like, e even if a band had, like, synths, I was like, that's not rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> you know, which is, like, stupid, and I've totally come the other way around it. But um, when I uh, first started recording by myself, like I mentioned a little bit earlier, I um, got that four track when mm -hmm. I was, you know, like 18, 19. And it was so hard because I try to do the drums first, like playing drums to nothing. And I wouldn't have a click track. Mm -hmm. So I'm just kind of hoping it's, you know, semi uh, static or whatever in uh, uh, just in rhythm. Yeah. And then I try to overdub the guitar and then the guitar would be so loud I could like barely hear the drums. So it's like, okay, I can't even like hear where I am. And then I would try to just, I even went to the length of manufacturing a click track by starting with me clicking drumsticks together first and then going back and like overdubbing the guitar <laughs> over that. So like, but that was my like humble beginning of recording. So now everything feels like super easy by comparison, but I'm yeah. also super glad I did that because yeah. it kind of built me up. Mm -hmm. But um, most of the time how it works is I'll write the, the song on the guitar, like I'll write the riffs and kind of figure out the changes and progressions on guitar. Mm -hmm. And I'll record that first. Um, kind of going back to what I was saying earlier about um, reflecting on my previous work and kind of writing in response. During those second and third batches of songs, I would sometimes start with the bass just to kind of mix it up. Um, but most of the time, I would record the guitar to the click track first, then I would do the bass. And then um, I would record real drums. This is just the demoing phase. Right. I would record real drums, but um, just being able to like hear everything is <laughs> so nice. But uh, And then I would not do vocals until the very end. So I would record all the music, do the demos. Then I would go into a proper studio. And then I would have to like do the exact opposite process because um, the engineer I was working with was very um firm about recording the drums first like you have to have the foundation to like build on even though i was like oh can i please just record the guitar to a click track no like, no you there's a formula that. and we need to yeah. follow that formula i mean he's he's right but it's just it's tough when you don't have any like scratch tracks or whatever to right, play, I guess, right, you know? right exactly um, right and it's funny on the very first batch of four i did um I realized that I wasn't sticking to the click perfectly. Mm. So when I tried to play to my demos, it was it just added a little extra work of kind of cleaning it up. So I was like, okay, I don't want to do that. I want to play the drums to just the click to make sure I'm dialed in. So that just involved me really learning the song to where it was like totally in my head and I could play the drums to just a click track and nothing else. Mm. And I'm also kind of hardcore about like, uh, I remember the engineer would say like, oh, you know, you don't have to actually like count all the pauses, you know, we can like cut that up, you know, and space it out later. And I was like, no, I want to like have the space for the guitar intro as I'm like doing the drum. So I'm just kind of sitting there bobbing my head at the clicks, like hearing the guitar in my head. And then I do um, all the drum parts and then I would go back and do the bass parts and then the guitar parts. Um, and then I would go home and that's when i started figuring out the melodies on the keyboard that i was talking about earlier right um and figuring out the vocals that way um and then writing words to those vocal melodies then going back and doing the vocals separately um and while that's going on i've kind of started on the next batch of songs but that's that's kind of how it went i always did the drums last in the demos um mm -hmm. just because I don't know. I, I'm a huge uh, Smashing Pumpkins guy. Those that was the band that kind of broke me open as like a teenager, and I was always a huge uh, Jimmy Chamberlain fan. And I always loved how he played drums. I always felt like he 
his playing added so much to the songwriting and just kind of the drive and feel of the song. And I always thought that was super important. So when I write drums, I always try to think about ways to help the song out as opposed to just kind of like locking down a, a steady beat. I try to think in terms of uh, song dynamics and how the drums can help with that. And I've just found that doing the drums last helps me with that yeah no that makes sense uh the same like you said in terms of actually recording it in the studio you know if you don't have a scratch track to kind of go off of and um work those little tiny details of you know dynamics or making this part come alive a little more and working around the guitar or the vocals drum wise uh, if you don't kind of go through that process, then yeah, you do have a tendency to just kind of think of drums as the foundation and just kind of holding the beat type of thing rather than a musical instrument. Yeah, exactly. Uh, did you, and and right now there's a, um, a lot of, a lot of people kind of talking about this buzzword demoitis right now. Mm. Uh, I've heard it quite a bit um, as of lately, but this idea of creating the demo and then going to record the actual CD uh, or the the final track, and then actually falling in love with the demo more than the actual final track. Uh, did you find oh. any of that happening at all? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think a lot of the reason is I'm not that great of a of an engineer or, or recorder. I'm not a huge like gear guy when it comes to recording. Yeah. yeah. So the demo process. Actually, I'm glad you brought this up. So the demo process for me is really about learning what the song is and being able to kind of hear it without playing it and hearing all the parts together, not just in my head, but kind of physically, right. Physically hear it all because I don't know if you guys have run into this, but I've run into this a lot where as I'm playing something, I think, Oh, this is the perfect accompaniment for the song. This is exactly how it should go. And then, stepping back and listening to the recording of that so now my brain is not thinking about playing and listening it's just listening mm -hmm. and for some reason i'll when i'm just listening it's like oh that's not the perfect accompaniment like as i'm playing it it felt right but as i'm listening to it i'm like oh i need to tweak it so that is a huge part of the process for me and you know when you're writing like um an accompanying like bass line to a guitar riff mm -hmm. a lot of times in my head i think i know how it should go but when i actually do it and listen back and kind of hear how all the parts are actually interacting with each other. Um, I I hear like, oh, that's not quite right. And I tweak it. But mm -hmm. um, in terms of demo-itis, yeah, all my demos are so crude. That <laughs> I would never <laughs> think to release that. Um, well, the idea is, is that, you know, some people and it doesn't even it doesn't really even matter if it is crude or not. It's this idea of I've listened to my demo so many times to mm -hmm. kind of get the idea of what's going on behind my song that it's just kind of stuck in your head uh that yeah. raw that rawness of it and then once you take it to the studio that rawness and that that um you know because we as home studio musicians when we hit the red light you know hit that button um it, there's not a whole lot of pressure and therefore that creativity has a little bit more leeway you can it, it can come out you know you can you can capture a moment pretty quickly if you're feeling inspiration um versus going into the studio you're under the pressure and it's just a little bit more yeah. intimidating clock's um, ticking you're spending money mm -hmm, exactly right so to be able to capture that same kind of excitement um it's a little bit different and that's where this whole demo itis comes from this is like yeah but i like that i like the feel that i got from that demo it was very raw it was very real how do i get that out of the studio i'm um, recording because it just almost sounds a little too polished mm. um so it's kind of an interesting concept that's come up i've heard like i said i've heard it for a couple of months now being mentioned over and over again and, and it's very real i mean I've, I've gone through the same thing where i'll record something and i'm like that's that's what's what i'm looking for but then you go to record it professionally and it's like ah this is cool i really 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 like this i love the final product it sounds nice and everything like that but boy there's lots of the demo that you know is missing you know there's there's parts of that demo that i'm just really loving mm. you know? i think uh the thing for me is i have a really great relationship with the engineer that i work with his name's uh don farwell he runs uh earwig studio in seattle and he's become one of my best friends over the years to be honest like i started recording with him 
uh, with my band in 2012 and he just like got it. And, uh, yeah. he, you know, had been in bands and I had heard his band's music and I totally loved his band's music. So I think, um, part of the thing for me is I have such a trust in the person I'm working with and he just makes it so comfortable for me yeah. in the studio that I don't really feel that that pressure of like, oh no, I gotta like do this <laughs> as fast as possible. And yeah. and I can tell him if I think something's too polished or squeaky clean. He he has no problem, you know, dirtying things up or making it more raw. So um yeah. I don't know. I think for me it's just having that that communication and that relationship with the the engineer and producer you're working with to try to get that sound out. I, I feel like the demos it's just kind of me learning what the song is. Um, and I don't spend too much time listening to it to where I get locked in. Like, this is how the song goes. This is the only way I want to hear it. Mm -hmm. And so when I go in the studio, um, I kind of have the foundation in my head that I can bring it out. And, um, Don, the engineer just really helps me kind of take it to a next level and can help me kind of realize my own vision. I don't feel like he's yeah. pushing his own, yeah. uh, vision. And, um, That's so great. that helps me a lot with the with the kind of transition between the demo to the, the studio version of the yeah. song. Having an engineer who's partially a songwriter is incredibly helpful. You're yeah. like almost producing it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you kind of get the both best of, best of both worlds. The engineer and the producer kind of helps you along and kind of realizes your vision and helps you along with that coming, making that come to fruition. Yeah, absolutely. And I remember yeah. he would have these super subtle suggestions that felt like nothing at the time to where I would do it just kind of be like, all right, Don, like, whatever, I'll try it. And then I'll <laughs> back and I'll be like, oh, my God, that like made the song, whether it was just like an amp choice or like a pedal choice. Like, I remember there was one song where I was doing a lead and I was done and the guitar was like feedbacking and I was kind of looking at him through the glass like, OK, stop. Right. And he was doing the like keep going thing of just like letting it go. And I was like, uh, OK, whatever. So I'm just like sitting there letting the guitar feedback it's like what is this so then i went back and he um he had incorporated it so it kind of bled back into that last chorus that happens after the solo so there's this kind of like feedbacky kind of fade in fade out kind of flange thing going on and i was like dude that is so cool you know <laughs> yeah just these small things you know like he would have these like amp choices like i was saying i'm not a huge like gear guy so he would just suggest these amps that just totally like articulated the the guitar tone in a way i wasn't thinking but was like so much better than just that maybe the more like generic tone i had originally gone with yeah just small things like that yeah yeah you're uh you're um taking up more of that sonic space and most guitarists that when they come in to the studio they do have this mindset of well i've got my amp and i've got my guitar and i'm gonna play on my amp and i'm gonna play on my guitar uh, but you do have that whole studio full of you know toys that you can play with um yeah. and and this fender strat and this you know les paul or whatever it is parker fly or it doesn't matter what it is through a marshall or a fender or you know high water whatever it is it doesn't matter um you, all of those are going to give you a different tone and if you have two different guitars or multiple sources the more that you can kind of play with that sound they're going to not trample on top of each other and kind of fill that that sonic space a little bit more full so you get that when you listen back you're like "Ooh, that that sounds nice and warm i like that mm -hmm. <laughs> or the opposite it, you might want it to cut you yeah know? right I've, I've definitely played my sound live is often what i would describe as warmer but then in studio stuff it's like okay let's try a telecaster on the yep. on the bridge pickup i mean on the yeah on the bridge pickup oh. and uh like i need that to cut because the it needs to have that treble to to be heard over the yep. piano and the rhythm guitar whatever it is studio playing in the studios i think it's just incredibly um it's it's fun because there's so much creativity just being able to like try something and hear back crystal clear I've I've had a good time trying different harmonies and that sort of thing and things that I would have never been able to try live. Yeah, it's the the studio. If you haven't been in the studios, <laughs> got to get in there. Yeah, I highly cool. recommend it. It's actually my favorite part of the process. Like I love playing live. It's great having that kind of energy going back and forth between the audience and the performers. But 
I just love the creativity in the studio. I love that like something doesn't exist and then you just like go in and something happens. And at the end of the day, like this thing is like existing in the real world. And I love when like ideas pop up, you know, it's like you just try something or something happens and you're like, oh, what was that? And it's like, oh, well, that's like perfect. And that's how the song goes now. And it's just like, yeah. whoa, you know, just you can capture that spontaneity or just capture capture a moment that can last forever. Yeah, there's a, there's such excitement in the studio, you know, yeah, that be it the actual recording process or, you know, the whole mix down process and the, the bands all like on pins and needles like, oh, man, this is so good. You know, that, that there's that excitement that happens where, like you said, you know, you've got nothing at the beginning and all of a sudden at the at the very end of it, you're you're able to give the client their that, that final piece and it's just like ah oh, this is this is exactly what i'm looking for it's such a gratifying feeling and there's such a release too because i i've felt in the past like before i've recorded a song it's like i carry the weight of that song like in my mind mm -hmm. but then it's like once it's recorded it's like okay i don't have to like carry i don't have to like remember it or i don't have to hold on to it anymore now it like exists and has a life of its own now yeah i could i could die and that song would continue to yep. exist yeah exactly well after i'm gone yeah. yep you you had uh you just mentioned the word release that um did you have a release party for your album or did you go through any promotional or anything like that it's kind of funny uh it really was a passion project and um i kind of did like the opposite of what i normally do with bands where i i've definitely had like release shows and stuff but for this, like, I just, I was honestly, like, more interested in what my other musician friends thought. So I would, like, send stuff to them and get their feedback and stuff. And um, yeah. it's kind of funny because I've been um, waiting to perform live because um, I just actually finished recording four new songs. And I think I might put out an EP just kind of for fun. Yeah. And I was thinking, like, oh, this would be kind of the time to, you know, get a band together to actually, like, learn the stuff, get some friends to help me out and oh, actually yeah. like bring it to life, yeah. you know, and actually do like a proper, cause it felt kind of weird to just kind of throw it up on the internet, you know, mm -hmm. cause if you don't have a band, it's like, okay, I can't actually like manifest this live <laughs> by myself. Right. Um, but I wanted sort of a, a reason to do it. And I wasn't like quite ready, I guess at the time, but now that I have these new songs, it's like, oh, I kind of want to put them out and I kind of want to, you know, have a band actually play and kind of, slide into uh, like a proper release or like maybe like m more of a like a bigger awareness of yeah. that album you know because it just didn't feel right to so i just kind of did like i don't know like a soft release i guess you call it where i just yeah. kind of put it up and but it was kind of a little it was a little anticlimactic i'll be honest but i think uh <laughs> but i think i'm ready now to and i have the like support from other musicians to mm -hmm. to help me out to like play the parts because that's a whole other tricky thing trying to get other people to come in and play what you wrote you know mm -hmm. just kind of do you a favor essentially yeah 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 but that whole process i imagine uh once if indeed you actually go through that process and actually have the uh other instruments or other musicians learn learn your parts and learn the score and oh man the the feeling of coming off of that first show where you know you've just performed your album the way that you know it was meant to be in a live situation oh that would yeah. just, just oh, wow you know arm arm hair is like wow <laughs> that's amazing <laughs> yeah yeah totally i i can't wait i'm really excited yeah i want to i want to go back to what you were talking about with in the within your recording process mm -hmm. and you were talking about recording everything live at least in your demoing yeah. stages have you ever experimented with um like i use ableton and like it's incredible to use the the midi instruments on there and at least in the writing phase i found like you know you can loop a couple measures and if you want to try to write a harmony or change the bass line you just grab the little note and move it over you know maybe not in the end actually keep that as your final recording maybe re record it with live instruments but have you ever experimented with writing using the those outlets i honestly haven't yet but it's something i'm definitely interested in going forward um after going through this album i i felt like i had reached a point where i had sort of taken my own style as far as i could 
it's like, okay, I've like made this statement and I feel like if I had continued to do this over and over again, I, I'd probably be treading water. So I've been looking for ways to kind of break out of my comfort zone creativity wise. Um, one thing I've been trying to get into is um, using synths more and just kind of breaking into that world. And, mm -hmm. and um, like I was saying earlier in my, uh, you know, older uh, like punk rock mentality i was very like anti-drum machine uh, you know when you play drums you want to hear that sound it just drum machines sound crappy by comparison you know, it's very like cold and i don't know robotic uh, you, but um you can't you made, can't replace acoustic drums that's for sure <laughs> yeah, especially like in a rock context but yeah. um i've been inspired by a lot of artists that have used drum machines in really creative ways so it's something i'm definitely interested in exploring now just to kind of like I was saying, break out of my comfort zone and try new things. Yeah, I, I think it's incredible. It's an incredible tool. Maybe, mm -hmm. like I said, maybe not as your, your final product, but to be able to like, here's the here's the song. What would it sound like if I move the crash, you know, to the upbeat, you know, to change little things and be able to instantly hear the, the full picture Yeah, is very useful. And I don't you said you use logic. Yeah. Does it have can you do MIDI drums on it? Oh yeah, it's got everything. Like um I was messing around on demos where it was like, you know, the S button is the kick and the K mm -hmm. button is the snare, You're just kind of doing like little finger drums, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's super fun just to kind of get something going. Yeah, you can do that and then you can uh at least on Ableton you can quantize it so it kind of like lines it up to a sixteenth note, kind of moves everything, it kind of perfects it a little bit yeah. if you wanna Shifts if you want that. To the grid, yeah. Yeah, it moves it to the grid. That's cool. That, like you were saying, get that like instant response. If you have an idea, you can hear how it sounds instantly and then kind of troubleshoot, you know, try different experiments and kind of perfect it in like a super fast amount of time. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, you know, working with synths and working with MIDI is, uh, it definitely opens a lot of avenues. I know with me for Pro Tools, I'll just sit with any one of the synths or expand. Uh, and I'll just sit there and kind of play around with things. And like you said, Joe, would shift, shift ideas around or shift blocks around and just kind of see what happens. Um, it's, it's always interesting. Something uh, kind of shifting things. It's always interesting, like to, uh, have a solo within a song. Um, you're creating a lead or something with that in a guitar or even with MIDI. Um, and then just, just kind of take that block and shift it. So where, where you would intentionally put all your root notes, like you were talking about before, Joe, you know, landing on the root or landing on the third intentionally within a solo or within a, in a, in a, in a chord progression, it's always interesting to be able to lift that shift it over by two bars or four bars, or even an odd one, like five bars and, and just hear how that solo sits over top of your chord progression is always really interesting. You're like, wow, that's not what i expected it to sound like that's interesting i never thought to do that that's very cool <laughs> yeah it, it really is it's it's very interesting to hear your guitar solo shifted and be able to hear it hit different accents that it, you normally didn't think it would hit and it's like wow okay that's that's cool <laughs> it's like what's it called when you play like fives over four right like a hema hema hematola hematola yeah kind of get a little bit of that effect yeah that's that's very cool yeah. yeah recording is so much fun i love it i love it it's it's there's nothing like like coming up with an idea um it's like oh, last night i was sitting here in, in this room till 3 30 in the morning and i had my daughter's little grand piano it's one of those really tiny um really tiny ones right and i'm sitting in here i've got my condenser microphone and my dynamics <laughs> mic in this tiny little grand piano and i'm coming up with ideas and it all for the songwriting club and by the end of the month it, it it'll be it'll be something i'm not sure exactly what it will be but i'm going to create something out of nothing uh, for me personally each month i try to uh kind of tagging on what you were talking about brent a little bit earlier uh I, I am purposely every month trying to create something different. Uh, my first month was like a jazz tune. My second month, February, was more like a singer-songwriter, um, upbeat, happy kind of song. This month I'm doing just unnatural sounds. So I'm doing like my kid's grand piano along with like I had a, 
uh, a dinner bowl that I was eating out of and I hit the side of the bowl and it's like, ding. And I'm like, that's being recorded. I'm going to be using <laughs> that. <laughs> so I'm just getting the different sounds later on when I'm going to try to do like an EDM song or a hip hop song, or I'm just going to try different things that I'm not usually used to doing, just to kind of expand my, my walls a little bit. Cause I think we all as musicians kind of need that at some point, we all definitely kind of, uh, find ourselves in these ruts um, and trying to kind of push ourselves in different directions is, is extremely important. Yeah. I found having things like deadlines or just constraints really can help your creativity. Yeah. It just kind of forces you to make something happen. You know, it's almost like, you know, a nine to five job or something where you have to like sit down and produce and, it, and it's sort of, it's so different from, like waiting for inspiration to strike. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you might think like, oh, maybe it won't be as good if I try to force it, but it always kind of at least creates something interesting. And maybe if the result is not what you want, maybe it'll lead you to the result. It'll That's, spark something. Yes, I absolutely agree 100%. You learn better if you continually churn out material versus yeah. if you just wait for inspiration because you are doing just that. You are doing a lot of waiting <laughs> yeah. Yeah. tony skulls who was on about i don't know 18 19 episodes of fret buzz with us he he was he really cared about songwriting and he was saying like you've got to practice songwriting just like you would practice your pentatonic scales on the guitar like he was a fan of writing what was a song a day or a song a week yeah yeah just like you know writing for the trash can like yep. this might not be anything doesn't matter it's practice mm -hmm. don't get too attached to each song yeah yeah the more you write the better you will be that you will get i tell these this to my students all the time and especially you know private students and bands um you know you have to write a eight terrible tunes to get your first good one you have to go through that process if you if you you can't get caught up on that first couple of songs and say oh you know this is this this sucks i don't want to do this anymore because it doesn't sound good well yeah of course it doesn't sound good nobody starts off doing anything playing the piano or the guitar or riding a bicycle or whatever <laughs> babies and walking you know nobody ever starts off perfect at it you have to fall a bunch before you get really good at it and songwriting is no different. You have to write for the trash can, like you were saying, Joe. You have to, you have to write a bunch of junk before you can kind of go, oh, okay. Now I'm starting to get the handle of this. Yeah, it's like even if you have a ton of natural talent, if you don't put the practice and work in, you'll never get there. You know, it's. I think a lot of people forget that, and they just see the end result. They just hear the song or see the performer on stage and think like, mm -hmm. "Oh wow, that person's so talented." It's like, "Oh no, you haven't seen like the hundreds of hours of me in my room. <laughs> you haven't heard all the demos that led to this. Like, you have no idea like yeah. how many failures it took to even." get me to this point now you know yeah yeah there's a there's a meme that keeps on coming up on uh, instagram that i see that's got the one computer screen where this guy's like you know hunkered down over this computer screen and editing and all this kind of stuff and it says how music is made and then underneath it it says how people think music is made and it's just a button <laughs> <laughs> it's like no if it were only that easy <laughs> yeah it'd get boring if it was that easy yeah, exactly. Yeah, where's the creative? Or something. Yeah, there would be yeah. like a formula that people would figure out. But that's the cool thing about music. There is no guaranteed formula. It's always a matter of uh, discovery and experimentation. You know, that's like part of the, the mystery and the fun of it. Yeah, yeah. I would disagree in that there is a formula, but it's <laughs> way too overused. Right. We, like, we've talked about this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we've talked about that. So somebody was, uh, it's called Music Memos. And it's for iOS, um, but it's I haven't used it yet, but he, he had suggested it to me. But apparently you can grab a guitar or a piano. I don't know. I, he, I guess we just talked about guitar, but um, it will record your guitar and then it processes it like real time. And then when you play it back, it'll put a drum beat to it and it'll put a wow. it'll put a chord progression behind it as well. I've heard of that. Yeah. 
that's like, pretty crazy yeah that's that's pretty crazy it's that's, like it's similar to my uh my trio plus looping pedal that i yeah. use for yeah. my performances i strum the chord progression in and it spits out drum beat and bass line which i can then modify on the fly yeah yeah it's pretty incredible yeah i mean it's great but at the same time it's like ah no no where's the creativity in that <laughs> technology has gone too far we found yeah. the line <laughs> yeah watson <laughs> watson's gonna be uh putting all the music out <laughs> yeah um oh well. oh well no no music is uh and we've talked about this on past episodes you know i i strongly feel as though that we are in a um you know music goes in um hills and valleys and i feel as though uh, and i could be wrong i'm um, but I feel as though we're in a little bit of a valley right now. I think that music hopefully can only go up from here. Um, I would like to see the music scene, be it rock, be it whatever it is, come a little bit more alive in the future. I feel like right now we're just kind of regurgitating a lot of the same things over and over again. The creativity is not as much um, as a what it was once upon a time and i'm just talking about a mainstream level mm -hmm. um uh, i would like to see the musicianship and the um, depth of music be a little bit more widespread uh, i feel in my opinion there's a lot of one note rhythm type of thing going on be it like mostly on a guitar where it's do 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 it's like one note it's like okay that's cool and i get it but at the same time there's so much more available musically and dynamically um that i i, I only see music hopefully getting a little bit better from here um, there's a lot of discussion about how blues has vanished from rock and roll um, I hope to see that come back at some point. Um, uh, but but there's guys out there like Gary Clark Jr. who's headlining festivals and okay, Rain but again, that, that's that's one person. I'm talking Tedeschi again, Trucks and I'm, I mean I'm there talking is about a like huge a, theme. yeah, but no Tedeschi Trucks that they've been around for a while. I'm talking about new people on the main scene. That it's you take a look at yesteryear. And that was all over the place. It was all over the place. Radio was filled with tons of people, tons of people who were musically challenging the landscape. And I don't see that happening as much right now. Do you think that has to do with the lack of uh, music sales or people buying music? Because I kind of associated it with yes. the fact that uh, labels are having such a hard time making money that all they're doing is investing in these acts that will have mass appeal right and normally that comes down to more generic bland music right right no I, I i agree with that wholeheartedly and it also comes down to the labels um not putting their trust in a band like they used to you know you right. used to have a label deals and stuff right you exactly you would have a label um who would take a band or actually they would take a handful of bands they would take 10 bands and those 10 bands they would develop them and if their first album or two flopped that's okay we're gonna stick with you <laughs> and develop you and we're you know we believe in you type of thing where now it the current way of doing it is, is that yeah we'll take on 10 bands and if one of them has a hit we're dropping the rest of them we're going to go with that one band and yeah, they may all about like uh, what can you do for me today kind of thing like it's you exactly gotta have right. that instant hit instant result otherwise yeah. you know there's no time to waste on yes time. absolutely i agree so yes i think that plays into a lot of it as well yes mm -hmm. Yeah. You got to go see your local bands yeah there are lots of people doing cool stuff it's just not on your fm radio stations yeah on Typically. the yeah on the indie scene or the underground scene or the local scene sure yeah absolutely there's there's lots of stuff out there and even you know even on spotify playlists or wherever you can find tons of stuff that's um musically just really interesting um and it's you know there's a wide variety out there but on the mainstream 
that's that's where I'm finding the disappointment is is it's just not pushed the way it used to be. Uh, and that for me is disappointing because unfortunately that's where a lot of our youth is getting their um, is is getting their information. Yes, they do use Spotify and whatnot like that, but most often not because you're not allowed to have a phone as a kid. Uh, your internet you should be a little bit restricted. <laughs> so that just leaves, you know, uh, radio and, and the popular the popular th things like that uh it's it's just like ah i i wish i could see the i wish i could see the variety that i used to you know when yeah. we were when we were growing up i think another part of the problem is that um the delivering system of music is so fractured like mm. in the 90s you know everyone in the country would be listening to the same thing. Whereas now there's so many different platforms and resources to get music. Yeah. And I fall into this too. You can fall into your own little niche oh, yeah. of music and only listen to that and only get suggestions for bands that sound like that. And it just kind of creates all these tiny little sub genres mm. as opposed to this big, kind of a uh, massive coalescing of everyone listening to the same thing and that becomes mainstream yeah um and that kind of goes back to what i was saying earlier where it's like the only thing that does become mainstream is this very sort of mass produced or uh like kind of bland uh non-offensive music that has a potential for mass appeal because yeah. that's the only thing that like breaks through yeah yeah i mean it, it used to be things like mtv you know what i mean everybody yeah. would go to mtv or vh1 and that's where they would get their music from um well, that's long gone now and it's just it's it's all over the place and yeah i mean even terrestrial radio i mean mm -hmm. i don't even remember the last time i listened to the radio <laughs> you know i'm always right. listening to podcasts or right. uh, you know spotify or whatever so yeah. i'm like curating my own music you know and it's really easy for me like i was saying to get cut off from uh, people that are are curating new music or kind of trying to drive a um, a new genre or what have you, you know. Um, yeah, so, yeah, it's it's tough. We don't we don't have those uh, singular voices or uh, curators like we used to. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see in the future how the um, arena rock or big bands or if that will cease to exist. I don't know if you'll see the big pink floyds or led zeppelin or pearl jams or uh i don't know if you'll see that again i maybe um maybe not as often i don't know it depends on what happens in the future with the whole landscape of music and how because it's a suffering industry right now it really is uh, they've yeah. got to do something that's for sure and uh, one other interesting kind of phenomenon that's come up in the last few years is um it's the era of reunion bands. Yeah. You know, all these people getting back together and, and touring again in a way that I don't think has ever happened in previous decades, you know, where it's just everyone's doing it. And I don't know if that's because people are going back and listening to the old music because suddenly it's available everywhere again. But uh, mm. I've almost seen uh, older bands reuniting, having more success than newer bands starting yeah. out. And maybe that's is has something to do with i don't know a need for nostalgia or something like yeah. that uh but yeah i've definitely seen this this reunion culture kind of explode yeah. in the last decade yeah i think with in terms of things that i've been witnessing and hearing from especially the kids is is that the information um musically um that those songs from yesteryear um give is much more um engaging um, people want to hear those songs because there's a lot going on within that that music versus now it's very stale in one tone um so yeah i could see that pulling back and getting that appreciation for for those bands of yesteryear and kind of going oh yeah well those bands <laughs> they've got a lot of cool stuff going on versus the stuff that's going on now it's kind of like it's not as not that it's not good i can't say that it's just not as uh, there's not as much going on within it. There's a lot of like, like, yes, the power chord existed back then in the, in the seventies and the, in the eighties, but it wasn't 
like the power chords for like were punk, you know, like you had the Sex Pistols and 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 the Ramones, and that was like that was the power chord. And like you had like Metallica and the metal scene also doing power chords, but even then they didn't. There was a lot going on within that music. When it was just straight up power chords, sure. Sex Pistols, Ramones, they were just doing straight up power chords and, but they got away with it because that was punk. That was a movement. That was a, that was a revolution that was happening around that time. Mm -hmm. Now popular music just uses power chords all the time and it's not used in a punk way. It's just because it's really easy to do and it's musical and I can throw four power chords together and now I've got a song or <laughs> you're lucky if you even hear a guitar in songs nowadays on the radio. Right. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> I think some of it too is the labels are thinking about the immediacy of a new song. Like it's all about make the money now, get in, get out. Yeah. And I don't think they're thinking about longevity like um, bands from previous decades were. No. So maybe that's why the songs are a little denser or just a little bit more complex even just in terms of what's going into them and, and what they mean to people and the longevity yeah yeah a and you know you you did have before a band working on a tune for months months at a time you know they'd sit down right. with their producer who not whatnot like that and they they'd work things out uh versus now now you usually have a team of people um and you're writing that song within an eight hour day mm-hmm you know yeah, and, <laughs> and the singer didn't write the words or you know they're just, right yeah you know learning someone else's melody over like a track that a producer wrote you know <laughs> yeah it's like the uh, imagine dragons or chain smokers it's like most of their stuff is they don't write it they have somebody else write it for them and they buy it and then they put it on the radio and sing it and labeled as the chain smokers yeah it's like oh my goodness gracious okay well, that actually kind of reminds me of how i've heard it described in like the 50s you know that kind of like factory mentality where you had you know songwriters and producers doing the tracks and then you'd have singers yeah you know that would just come in and and just do what the the producers did you yeah. know and weren't connected to it but uh yeah it definitely yeah. i don't know i think it goes back to the business in a lot of ways it's like what can make the most money today and just kind of i don't know get it yeah. get out not really thinking about longevity that's just my theory at least no i i agree i i think uh it's all about the money it really is this is that they're i think there's i think they're struggling i think that uh that um it's the money in music is nowhere near what it used to be even 20 years ago and they're scrambling they're scrambling for a buck and then any way that they can get that buck they will <laughs> yeah and i really think it's on us as as local artists and you know podcasters communicators to express to people the importance of going to live shows and supporting yep. local music you know i i really held out for a long time on getting spotify just because i knew it was screwing over musicians but you know eventually i, I i'll admit it i i did cave and <laughs> i love it yeah but um yeah yeah but I, I don't think most music fans or just regular people understand the importance of their attention when it comes to just going to shows and, you know, paying for a cover, paying for an album, even if it's a digital copy. I mean, it really is, you know, the lifeblood of a local musician. And if people are upset that there aren't more independent artists, you know, it, it really starts on that level you know um yeah. it, it goes both ways and everyone's you know involved and has their role to play but um i think with us being you know kind of uh local independent musicians we really need to explain that to people the importance of that to, to get that scene thriving yeah yeah no i agree i agree well, thank you guys so much for having me it was really cool to to meet you guys and talk to you guys and i'm really stoked about this uh workbook you're you're putting out i really want to yeah. check it out thank you i'll thank send you. you an advanced copy just to get your yeah, feedback on what might not be as clear as you think it should and that'd be very helpful for me yeah um, I'd, I'd love to be involved that sounds awesome yeah, yeah and so uh you can find brent uh brent's podcast solving sounds um check it out he's got some cool things to say similar 
vibe as us in a lot of ways different different people different topics yeah is there um, a uh, is there a website or what kind of social media should people follow you on yeah so uh our facebook and instagram is just uh, solving sounds podcast um the website is uh well the podcast is hosted through libsyn so it's just libsyn dot com slash solving sounds podcast but I'm sure wherever you're listening to Fret Buzz, you can find us as well. You know, we're on uh, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, all those. So try to make it easy to find. Cool. But uh, that's where you can find me. Excellent. What about your album? Yeah, that's uh, on Spotify and iTunes. It's just under my name, Brent Lyons, and it's called Inflow. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you so much, Brent. We really do appreciate it and have had a wonderful time. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you guys so much for having me. Okay. Excellent. And we'll see everybody next week for another episode of Fret Buzz the Podcast. Thank you for coming out, guys.